and all right. And now I'm going to turn this over to, to Sheena. Okay. All right. Uh, first, can you see that? Can yes. See the, okay, perfect. Uh, Buzu, miigwech. Uh, Northern Michigan University is on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy. Um, and now we're going to jump all the way around the world to central Turkey. Um, so this is an image of the archaeological site, Chitzel Huk. Um, and, and so I do what we call, I do archaeology, but I also do ethnoarchaeology, where we use ethnographic field methods to study how current people, um, current populations do things to then create analogies about the past. And, and archaeology, uh, kind of under the big umbrella of anthropology, is this kind of bridges the gap between science and the humanities, um, where the kind of the most scientific of the humanities or the most uh, humanistic of the social sciences, we kind of bridge that gap, drawing on both qualitative and quantitative data. And um, I think my work really exhibits that as well. So I'm gonna kind of start in the Neolithic about 9,000 years ago, and then take you to a contemporary village nearby where I study cooking in both situations. To give you a little context though, um, Chetelhuk is a uh, Neolithic, and it, it's hard to pronounce, it's okay if you don't get the pronunciation. Um, it's a Neolithic town in central Anatolia in the middle of Turkey um, that was occupied about 9,000 years ago. And I, I would argue it's even a city, uh, somewhere between 3,000 to 8,000 people live there at any given time. And it was occupied for close to 1,800 years. So really long duration of time, right at the origins of agriculture that they, they had. Um, this was a, a settled village or city or town, however you want to envision it. Um, you can see with kind of this, this image here is an aerial view of the site. Um, and the site is formed from houses and buildings on top of each other. So they built mud brick buildings. And over time, as they would rebuild a new building, they'd collapse the old one, build on top and continue building up. And this site in terms of archeology span is really sexy. It's amazing because the preservation is phenomenal um, and it hasn't really been disturbed because if we go back to this picture, the Konya Plain is flat. Um, those mountains are about a hundred miles or so away. And it's just this flat plain. It's very fertile now because there's an underground river. Um, in the Neolithic, it would have been all marshy, kind of wetlands. And so this, the site itself sort of elevated the city out of the wetlands. Um, and so they subsisted primarily on a combination of both wild and domestic. So they were both foragers and farmers. Um, they grew things like emmer wheat, um, some of the first agricultural products. They had um, a whole bunch of, um, whole bunch of different species of plants and animals that were domesticated, but they also were hunting and they were gathering. And so we see that conflux of both um, hunters and gatherers and foragers and farmers and settled. And it's interesting because we're pretty sure people were moving along around the landscape pretty extensively, almost like you would imagine hunter gatherers, but returning to this quite large settlement. Um, this is just one of the occupation areas. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, by the way. Um, this is one of the occupation or one of the excavation areas of the site. And it's under this kind of permanent shelter and left open for tours. And so you can see every single one of these is a building. And arguably they're probably houses. We, we like to just call them buildings so we don't assume occupation or, or inhabitation, but that's our, probably what they were. Um, and their houses are really cool, but I'm gonna kind of situate us in space quickly first. Um, so we're looking, so here's kind of a big map of the region. Um, we're looking at central Turkey. Çetelhuk is this big blob right here. And these are a bunch of kind of contemporaneous um, Neolithic, so early agriculture about 9,000 years ago sites. Um, and then the, at the mound itself, there's two mounds, um, what we call the east mound, which is primarily Neolithic, and then the west mound, which is Calcolithic, which is a little bit later. Um, they start to get different technologies. And so we change kind of the time frame. Um, but the site, we're kind of blessed to have a whole bunch of really skilled scientific illustrators. And so you'll see a lot of really beautiful recreations that have been done by our, our illustration team. 
And this is an idea of what the site might have looked like during the Neolithic when people were inhabiting it. And it's interesting because unlike here where we kind of settle on a farmers settle on their 40 acres and they have their house and their barn and all their fields kind of within eyesight, we're pretty sure that the, the agricultural fields were pretty far away from the site. Um, and the site, actually going back to here, these two mounds during the Neolithic and Calcolithic would have been separated by a river. That river is now underground. Um, but during, during the Neolithic, when people were living there, it's a big river in the wet season. This would all turn into a big marshy wetlands. And then in the drier season, it would dry out a little bit. Um, and this is a, the, the climate of the Konya Plain where the site is, is interesting because it's kind of like, a, it's a desert-like environment, except they have a lot of water. Um, so it still it, it experiences those pretty extreme temperature swings. Like in the summer, it'll swing um, from about 55 degrees Celsius during the daytime and drop pretty close to like 15 or 10 degrees Celsius overnight. Um, and it'll be days where it's just boiling, boiling hot. We're wearing, we're, we just like you're melting in the sun. And then at nighttime, you'd like to have your winter jacket. Um, and, and the winter is, is quite a lot of rain, a little bit of snow, but mostly rain. So, and it's a really, really, um, it's a big alluvial fa fan. And so there's a lot of clay and it's interesting because there's almost no stone. So usually when we look at Neolithic sites, there's a lot of ground stone tools. There's a lot of what we call fire cracked rock and a lot of other stone elements on the site. Chitzeliuk is kind of an exception to that um, with the exception of chipstone tools, which the raw materials for chipstone tools at Chitzeliuk come from those mountains off far in the distance that they primarily use obsidian that comes from the volcanoes. Otherwise they're using clay. And they use clay for just about everything. And that's kind of what I primarily study is the cooking. Um, and, and the site, the, the site has all these really cool um, wall paintings as well. So there's a bunch of images of the artifacts and the wall paint recreations of the wall paintings here too. Here's another image of what the site might've looked like in a drier time period. This is showing the later Calcolithic West Mound and then sort of the, the decay of the East Mound over here. Um, and one of the thing that, things that they did was they hunted the bull oryx, um, which is a Pleistocene mammal that's extinct now, um, but they were huge, like standing about six feet tall. And these are the horn cores. And so many of the buildings have the horn cores on these kind of platforms in the corners. Um, and this is, these are some of the artifacts. Here's a really nice ceramic vessel with a human, what looks exactly like a human face on it. We call it the face pot. Um, so there's some more wall paintings. And we have a lot of these kind of lumpy, voluptuous figurines, possibly female. Although we, this is a recent one that we found, um, which is, to me, looks more, much more like a sumo wrestler. But it's interesting because then the skeletal team, we have a lot of human remains at the site. Um, they buried the dead in the floor. And the the human remains show that they were really strong, skinny, sinewy, kind of like a runner's build almost. Um, and yet all of the human figurines, the humanoids are, are quite voluptuous and, and rotund. Um, so there's kind of this interesting disconnect between what people looked like and what their, their figurines look like. And they also have these kind of animal figurines which there's a lot of conversation about what they might be. They could be for counting herds or something like that. But I always look at them and I think they're children's toys. Um, they're these little tiny, like they look like animal crackers. Uh, and this is one of my favorite artifacts from the site. I always bring it in. It's a, what we call a mini ball. So it's a little clay ball, but it has the entire top and bottom dental impressions of a four-year-old. So you can just kind of imagine sort of 9,000 years ago, somebody was doing something and we're not entirely sure what these mini balls were for, but then some little kid comes in and just takes a bite out of it, right? Um, and so what I study at Chitalhuk is the cooking and the site itself is phenomenal. I could talk all, a lot about it, but I wanna focus more on the food. So the earliest levels of the site, they have really coarse ceramic, um, which they weren't cooking with. Um, we're pretty sure in the earliest level, 
they were cooking with baskets as seen in this recreation here with what we call clay balls. And these clay balls are really, really silty. Um, they're almost a pure silt with just enough play, clay in them to allow for the plasticity to shape them and prevent them from exploding after repeated heating. And well, they do explode sometimes, but exploding immediately when you heat them. Um, and so they're these, these solid balls about kind of the size of a baseball to a grapefruit. They range in size um, and they show signs of being repeatedly heated and reheated. And we're, they're all over the place in the earliest levels of the site. And we're fairly certain that they were used in cooking. Um, and if, and going back to the talk, the discussion about it being an alluvial plain, there's no rocks really available. Um, many other sites have this long tradition of stone boilers where when people are cooking, they, you can do indirect heat transfer where you put the stone in a fire, you heat it up, you throw it in your basket or your hide bag and you stir really fast. You have to stir really fast so it doesn't blow a hole through the side of your basket or your bag. Um, but it is really, really efficient for boiling. So it's a really efficient way to make soups or stews um, or boil water for any kind of use. And but we don't have any fire cracked rock at Chitzelhuk, which is really rare for an archaeological site of this time period. But we have probably like hundreds of thousands of these clay balls. So many clay balls are just everywhere. And so we're pretty sure that the clay balls serve the purpose of the stone boilers. There's no stone available, but there's an abundance of clay. Um, so we have these clay balls in the earliest site part of the site. And then moving later in time, we start to get really nice ceramic vessels. Um, and my slides are out of order, hold on, there we go. So that later in time, we get these really nice ceramic vessels. And then instead of doing the indirect heat transfer with the clay balls, the pot just sets straight in the fire or set over what we call pot stands. Um, and so one of the things I've been looking at is, and these are some of the later pot stands. And you'll see this pot stand here, um, the earliest, some of the earliest pot stands really look remarkably like a clay ball with a lumpy blade base on them. And so my, one of my interpretations is that kind of when the clay balls stopped being used for stone boiling, they were also still just kicking around and they, they take on a new life, they get reused. And so in some cases they end up being um, the lining or the foundation service of a new oven. And I'll show you some ovens in a minute. Um, but I would say that other times they become the base or an early pot stand, because if you look at the vessels, all of our pottery vessels have this, are this big round, kind of rounded bottom vessel. So they don't stand really well on their own. If you stick them in a fire and ashes, they'll balance in the ashes, but that's going to scorch and burn the bottom of your food. So you want to raise that up a little bit. Um, and if you have a bunch of clay balls kicking around, that's a good way to do it. And then later they start to build these much nicer, much more intricate um, and then highly decorated and designed pot stands. And you can see these holes in these, that's probably to help move them in and out of fire where you can take kind of a pokey stick and pick it up and lift it and move it um, and arrange it however you need so that then you can have a nice pot sitting on these pot stands. And this one is, the, the image of the pot over the with the pot stands is a recreation in the museum at the site of Chisel Um, And so these are, I, I'm kind of out of order, sorry about that. Um, so this is an image of an oven. So these are in pretty much every building at Chisel has an oven that looks similar to this and then a, a hearth like this. And this oven would have been enclosed right up here and then would have had a little opening here. And you can see what's truncated or broken in antiquity. And a lot of times these would have been raised when they built new houses. Sometimes they were packed with stuff and infilled and sometimes they were kind of truncated and broken down. This is one that's preserved pretty, pretty well. Um, and there's almost always an oven and a hearth. And so there's different kinds of heating the home, of cooking, Right, they're both were used for cooking and we can, we've indicated that from looking at the flotation samples. So when we do, we'll collect all of the surface, the, so, the sediment and we'll float it 
and any of the light fraction, which is typically your organic burnt organic materials like seeds or nutlets or charcoal or um, nutshells or anything like that will float. And when they float, then we can identify kind of what's going on. And so we start to see the domesticated plant species that were, that they're eating at the site in, in these sediments. So we know both of them are used for cooking. Um, but the fact that every building has one of each is really an interesting thing because, and sometimes they have multiples, but so they're clearly using these differently, right? We have ovens and stoves and microwaves or instant pots now and toaster ovens and all these things. Um, and going back into to the Neolithic, they did too. They had all sorts of different ways to cook. And speaking of going back to the clay balls, there's an interesting juxtaposition, juxtaposition with the clay, ball, clay balls as we transition to the ceramics. And that's like kind of the middle of the occupation of the site. And the clay balls um, were really fast and efficient, but they require almost constant attention, right? So it's kind of like you're cooking on the stove or grilling on grilling and you just have to be there constantly. You can cook much quicker, but you have to pay attention to it. Whereas with the pots, you it's kind of like a slow cooker, right? You can just kind of throw your stuff in the pottery, in the ceramic vessel, set it on or by or over the fire and walk away and go and do other things. And so we see these neighboring buildings, contemporary, contemporaneous buildings that were occupied at the same time. And yet one has clay balls for almost a hundred years longer than another. And then the other one is switched to the new ceramics. So is this because of an access to the raw materials or an access to the, the types of clay? Because they're used with different clays. The um, clay balls are a local back swamp clay. So they come from the marsh, they're right there on the site. Whereas the really fine ceramic vessels that they're cooking with later come from over in that mountainous area about a hundred miles or further away. And so people are moving and they're getting their raw materials or they're making their clay pots over there and they're bringing them back. Um, or they're bringing the clay back and they're making it there. Um, so it, it's this, this difference might be a preference in cooking style, right? Like some people like to stick with the older traditional ways. Others like to quickly transition and follow the new technologies. We see the same sort of replicated in our, our society today. Um, yeah, so this is, and so they have kind of have this nice little raised hearth. They're these really beautiful, ovens and hearths. Um, here's some other examples. This is a, an oven and here's a hearth that had, or, sorry, this is an hearth. And then this big horseshoe shaped one is an oven. And this was truncated in antiquity. So in the Neolithic, when they started to level their building to build another one, they, they collapsed that and they built on top of it. And these buildings are built out of mud brick, which is just clay baked in the sun until it's hard. And then they use those mud bricks to make the walls. And then they plaster the walls with this, um, with marl. There's a, almost a pure white marl that's locally available. And they replaster the walls and the, the surfaces of the ovens and hearths seasonally. And then you, those images I showed you earlier with the kind of recreations of wall paintings, those wall paintings are on the walls. And we know that they re we that they're um, refinishing or, or repainting or replastering, whichever one you want to call it seasonally. It's almost like a cement. It's a really nice, fine, well-preserved material. And they do it seasonally. And we can tell from taking micro micromorphology blocks. So we'll kind of cut a big hole in the wall and take one big section right out of the wall and then impregnate that with resin and take thin sections of it and look at it under the microscope and you can identify all sorts of really cool things primarily pollen um, and so they can see what kind of pollens were in between the layers of, of plaster and from that they can figure out what time of year it was plastered um, and the other thing that we find from the micromorphology is that these fires were really efficient um, looking at the at these ovens and hearths one would think that you'd end up with like black and sooty walls with poor in buildings with poor ventilation, um, but they're not. They're really well ventilated. They're really, really sophisticated um, fire installations that probably burned very efficiently and very cleanly. Um, and then they're replastering seasonally. 
So here's a recreation of what, what this might look like. And this is an interesting thing too. You'll see this stair, this ladder here. We have ladders pretty much above all of the ovens. And the buildings are interesting. They're all um, kind of abutting walls, right? So kind of like a bunch of townhouses all kind of on top of each other with, but with their own individual walls hitting each other. Um, and there's no doors, there's no exterior doors, at least from what we found. So um, unfortunately, the people at Chateau were really tidy, they're really neat. Um, going back to the mud brick walls, a mud brick building lasts about 100 to 150 years. And then the mud brick just starts to what we call slump. So after a lot of weathering and rain, primarily, um, that sun-baked clay just starts to slide down. And all of a sudden you have a pretty narrow kind of bendy, not very useful wall up here. And then a really fat, lumpy, un unwieldy wall at the bottom. And then when it gets to that stage, they would collapse the walls in um, at about a meter in height. And then they would infill it with trash. And then they would often use those the, those collapsed walls as the foundations for the next building. So they take those slumped walls that had collapsed down at the one meter in height and use that as their foundation as they built up higher. Um, but they had a really long, long memory of these places because they were often going back um, doing retrieval pit, digging retrieval pits into the old buildings, um, sometimes into the burials because they buried their dead below the floor, often in the um, often in those platforms, like I showed you that picture with the Bucrania towards the beginning, they'll bury their dead below the floors. And then occasionally they'll go back and they'll, after the body is totally decayed and retrieve the skull and bring the skull back out. And we find a lot of these red plastered skulls. Um, and they're interesting because they're covered with, with the, the marl, the white plaster, and then a layer of red, which would have probably been red ochre, um, a, a red pigment. And, and red, the red ochre is interesting because ochre is um, a mineral that kind of ranges from yellow to red. And the more it oxidizes, the darker red it gets. Um, but it starts yellow. So in antiquity, it was, or, or in the Neolithic at Chitilhuk, it was probably, it was, it could have been red, but it could have been yellow. It's in that, it's one of these things that just gets darker with more oxygen. Um, but if you think about them as probably closer to yellow, that might look, or, or kind of a, a red, that looks very human-like, right? And they do, it really does a good job of sort of refleshing or, or giving you a better idea of what this skeleton looks like. And one of my favorite hearts has um, a skull, just kind of one of those red plaster skulls laying on top of it at the closing of a house. And there's all sorts of things that they do to their ovens and hearths when they close them. There's another really interesting one that has um, a dog burial, a canine just sort of laid out into the opening of the oven and then the house has collapsed or the building has collapsed and they build on top of it again. Um, but we're pretty sure then, at least from this lower level, and we don't know what's going on above, we have some indication that there are some some buildings with at least two floors. Um, so there might be multiple stories with doors outside, but from the slowest level that's preserved in most of the buildings, there's a ladder going up and, and there aren't any exterior doors. So we're pretty sure that people were moving across the site on the roof. Um, and there's almost no paths or road or like a sidewalk or any kind of pathway through the site. And it's really densely populated with thousands of buildings abutting each other and people would walk across the site. And it, and it always just is something that is funny to me because I've lived in apartments with neighbors upstairs and it's the worst when they're kind of clomping around. And if you imagine not only are your neighbors upstairs but your, your roof is the main thoroughfare through your city, a city occupied by 3,000, 8,000 people. Um, and so it's interesting to kind of try to imagine the landscape, the cityscape, the soundscape, the smellscape, especially as you kind of go back to the idea that the dead are buried below the floor where they're living and sleeping and cooking and eating and, and making chipped stone tools and all sorts of other things. Um, 
So here's kind of a general layout of the buildings at Chetel Hug. They're not very large. Um, so this is about, so you, this scale bar is three meters, sorry, two meters. Um, so the buildings are, are relatively small, um, but some of them have had sort of upwards of a hundred burials in the floor. Um, and this particular one has a nice big oven right here. And then we have kind of different spaces and platforms and various other things. Um, and there would have been a ladder right here kind of coming up above the oven. But I just wanted to show you kind of what they looked like in plan. Um, here's another really brilliant recreation of what one of these houses would have looked like at Chitil Hugh. So you can see some of the wall paintings. You can see the oven area over here. There's a little hearth here, the ladder going up to the roof, people walking across the roof, and the burials below the floor, below the platforms. Um, we we kind of divide the building into what we call the dirty area and the clean area. The dirty area is um, kind of gray. The, the white plaster floor takes on a gray coloring because it's full of ashes and debris from the fire. So they'll rake out their fire and that inherent that ends up on the floor. Whereas this area over here, these platforms kind of further away from the cooking area are really pristine and white even still today. And so we, we just sort of create this little boundary. Um, so as I'm trying to answer these questions about cooking in Chitil Hugh, um, I've never cooked with earthen ovens, right? I can study the clay. I can study the, the clay balls and the um, what we call pot stands. And I can study the, the objects themselves. Um, but it's really hard to create analogies about how they were used in the past without ever having cooked with them. And fortunately, the village of Kuchikoi, which is um, about a kilometer away from Chitalhyuk, still uses these beautiful earthen ovens um, called tonder and ojak. And the tonder is kind of like the, the, the tandoori style um, bread oven with a slightly kind of different twist. And the ojak is basically like your cook stove. Um, and so this is the town of Kuchikoi or the village, it's a really small village of just a couple, just about a hundred people or so. And this is a really big tonder. And so what they do here is a, that's like a, a very particular frame that goes in there. And then this is all just like fill. Um, and then it's covered and that's the plaster. It's covered in that white plaster that I was talking about that they use at Hugh. And it, they're using the same building materials today in Kuchikoi as they used at and the really interesting thing is the interior part of these ovens is really remarkably similar to the interior part, the, to the primary part of the ovens at Kuchiko, or at, at Chitalhuk. It's just like now has a bigger superstructure. And this big superstructure serves a couple purposes. For one, it retains heat for, for days. And so they'll use it for drying. Um, right here, they have a whole bunch of nuts and apricots set out to dry. And um, I think some chaff or, or hay that they're drying, parching as well. And so they'll use it for drying and parching because it gets really, really hot. But they also use it for water. Um, this slide here shows kind of the more, more people are starting to get this um, solar panel hot water heating on their roof. Um, but it's still pretty expensive for this part of Turkey where the, the average annual income is about 100 US dollars a year. Um, and they're mostly subsistence farmers. Um, they do grow some sugar beets um, that are pretty big cash crop, but otherwise they're, they're pretty, um, and they grow melons. It's a really big melon region, but otherwise they're pretty much subsistence farmers and uh, they have herds as well. So here's a tonder um, and here's the ojak. In this image, that's just heating water. Um, cooking, they would let the fire simmer down before they burn it. And so similar, they kind of moved. It's very, very similar to the ovens and hearths I'm studying at Chitil Hugh, except they've moved outside. And they're still really efficient, but they moved outside um, for pretty obvious health reasons, right? Burning biomass fuels, primarily dung, which is the primary fuel used at Chitil Hugh and in Kuchikoi, the modern village. Um, 
burning those fuels is pretty detrimental to the health. Um, and so moving this outside, you allow for a lot more airflow. But these, uh, the, the OJAC are not nearly as fuel efficient, but the Tonder, the bread ovens, these are really, really fuel efficient. There's very little smoke. So there's very little, un, there's very little unburnt fuel. Um, and, and dung is a really efficient fuel source too. Um, but it's really kind of a, a compelling narrative as I, I'm here studying how these are used to better understand the past. Um, but as I do it, I found this really interesting juxtaposition of kind of modernity with um, kind of liberation. And so this is where I kind of start to talk about and think about gender. Um, Kuchikoi is a really, really gendered village. Um, it's, a, it's a very Islamic part of the country in Turkey. Um, primarily the women do all of the cooking and the household tasks, the men work the fields, the women work the fields too some, but the men like work out in the city, um, they work out and then the women are primarily at home except when they're um, harvesting or, or pulling weeds in the fields. And there aren't very many ways for the women to socialize. Um, traditionally, the women would gather every week in large groups um, and they live in a kind of extended family compound. So they've got a big brick walled courtyard with multiple residences and then an exterior kitchen area and then the cooking areas with these ovens and hearths or with the tonder and ojak. And so it's often um, patrilocal. So the parents will live there and then their adult sons and their wives coming in often from other neighboring villages will marry in move to this area with their husband's family. And the women do all of the household labor and the men do kind of the exterior labor. And every the village, all the villages in the area have a tea house. And that's kind of the social space for the males, for the men, they kind of hang out, they drink tea, they play a lot of backgammon. Um, there's very little public alcohol consumption in this part of Turkey uh, because it's very Islamic. Um, and, and the women primarily are at home. So in, in the past, the women then would gather in groups of 20 or 30 women to bake bread and they'd bake bread all day on, on a week end, usually Saturday or Sunday. They'd bake bread all day and they'd take it home for the week and then they'd gather again next week. And that became their really social, engaging, interactive kind of way to, so, to, to socialize in an acceptable way with their peers. Um, however, recently, many of the women, many of the households have saved up enough to have freezers. And with the freezers then, instead of gathering in groups of say 20 to bake bread, um, and I'm just gonna scroll through some more pictures of these because they're really cool. Um, instead of gathering with, the, with their neighbors and their friends, it's just now the small household. So instead of 20 some women coming together to bake every week, it's now three or four women, generally of the same household compound coming in to bake monthly. And then they bake enough bread for the month and they freeze it. Um, and so all of a sudden, this really great way to socialize for the women and one of the only acceptable ways for them to socialize is gone. Um, but now it also kind of liberates their time. And so, be, and like the water becomes another thing too, because they use, there's a picture, here we go. Let me skip forward one second and I'll come back to the bread baking because that's cool. So they, they heat, use the, the large superstructures of the oven of the Tondor and Ojak to heat water. And so the build, the housing, the houses that now have solar water, they also don't need to do that. So they're not, they don't need to fire them as much. So if you wanna fire your tondeur and bake bread weekly, you also have water for a couple of days because they stay hot so often, long. But if you now have a freezer that you can bake bread monthly and you have rooftop solar heat, heated water, all of a sudden the women have far more time on their hands, but they're not allowed to really socialize. But the interesting thing that's happened then is the young girls are staying in school. So the average, um, Previously, kind of the average kid, person in Kuchikoi had about a sixth grade education. And most of the most of the sort of over kind of 60 year old population 
are illiterate in modern Turkish um, because they've changed the alphabet a bunch. There was they were on the Arabic alphabet and then the Cyrillic alphabet, and now they're on the Latin or Roman alphabet. So they keep changing the alphabet. So people who used to be literate are no longer. Um, but the average age of education that they stopped going to school was about seven, sixth or seventh grade. And that's still true for the boys. Around sixth or seventh grade, the boys get pulled out of school to, to work. Um, and yet the girls now, because the, the women's work is the household work and the household work has become more efficient with hot water heaters and freezers, um, the girls are liberated from that. And so the, the mothers and the grandmothers are kind of losing out their socialization, but the girls are staying in school. And so the first three women, the first three people from Kuchikoy to have, to, to earn their bachelor's degrees are three women who kind of had this opportunity because all of a sudden there's all this free time. Um, and so it is this interesting kind of cost in, of, of labor and tradition and modernization. Um, and then there's kind of adding to it, people are starting to bring propane, tank, propane um, stoves into the houses as well. And there's sort of trade-off between taste and smell. They don't like the smell of cooking in the house. Um, which is, I always find funny because I come in my home and I like the smell of food cooking is a thing that I find delightful and amazing. And it's something that gets me excited about being home or whatever I'm gonna eat for dinner. And yet to them, that's a bad smell. They don't like it in the house. And I think that's hard to unpack from the fact that primarily, traditionally they've cooked with biomass fuels. So you can't separate the smell of food from the smell of, of burning of, of like a bonfire. Um, but here's a really good image of the bread and how they make the bread. And it's kind of like, you go like this, make kind of nice, thin, tonder, almost pancake-like things. And it gets thrown like this to the side. And this is a really special, um, clay material inside and it'll stick to the side. And then once it's done, once it's done, it'll start to peel away and fall. And so the trick is to catch it before it falls and flip it over and throw it back up. I failed every time I tried to do this. I tried to do it and it, it often resulted in like just singeing all the hair off my arm and also dropping the bread into the fire. Um, but you can see this is the way the oven is used, um, much like we saw at Chetelhuk where people are moving across the roofs, here they're on top of the oven. So they sit on these little, like where these blankets are, you'll sit on top of it and then reach inside. So you lean right over the fire um, it's so boiling hot. I don't understand how they do it because it's also really hot in the summer and they throw the things on the side. Um, and it's, these fires are so efficient. They're so good at using, um, often like old, the old, um, olive oil tins or olive tins, like those big kind of aluminum square tins that are pretty common throughout the Near East, um, to control, and regulate their fires. Um, there's some more good pictures. And so you kind of see this really great juxtaposition of the past and the present, right? Like how are things used in the past? I can learn about them by studying what they're doing in the present. And so from studying about the, the cooking and food ways at Chitilhuk, I start to kind of get a much better understanding of going back to that shift from clay balls to, to clay pots, and then later there's a shift to pot stands. You can see all these shifts in cooking technologies at Chitzel Hu. And as I did these interviews and hung out really just cooking with the women in Kuchikoy, I started to see very similar things where some of the households really rejected the modern technologies and others embraced them and embraced the ease and convenience while others liked the flavor and the taste or the cost. And so you have this kind of balancing act, but and, and it, it applies to both, I think, Chitilhuk and Kuchikoy, right? The balancing act of household economics, the cost of acquiring new technology or new raw materials um, or things like propane versus using the things that are available, the locally available clays, right? Building these earthen ovens and hearths that's all locally available clay. Um, Dung is free, but they keep cows. 
there's a huge abundance of dung on the landscape um, to use and, and burn to fuel your fires. And so it is this really good balance between trying to create these ethnographic analogies about how things might have been done in the past, right? Because as we do archaeology, it's like this puzzle, but it's a puzzle that we don't have the picture of. We don't really know how to how the picture flows together. Um, we don't know whether or not we have all the pieces. We don't know how many pieces we're missing because what's preserved archaeologically um, is sometimes kind of a crapshoot. Uh, it's we there's a lot of stuff that's never preserved, and so we have this really interesting balancing act where we try to identify what was going on in the past, how they were using it in the future. Um, and so with this, I, I kind of got off on a tangent, which is fine. There's a lot to do. I'd like to just kind of pause and let you have questions now, though. Um, so yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, if anybody has any questions, you can unmute yourselves um, to ask or put them in the chat. I'll, I'll monitor the chat, too. Um, does anybody have any uh, comments or questions for Sheena? It's always this moment where they're either typing or, or trying to think of other questions that they've come up with. Um, let's see, I got to scroll through to see. Um, you know, one of my, one of the questions, I mean, how long have you been, have you studied um, these two areas? I mean, it, I mean, you know so much about these, both the uh, archeological dig and then the, the neighboring city. I mean, how long have you been studying this, this particular region? So um, let's see, Chitzelhuk is hard because there's a lot. Uh, it's one of the biggest research projects in the world. Um, any given point, we have about a hundred researchers on site when we're digging. Mm -hmm. um, I've been involved with that project since um, about 2008 or 2009. And mm -hmm. then um, I only, I spent really just two summers in Kuchikoy, so in the village. Um, and that was, I'm going to turn off my screen share really quick. Mm -hmm. So I, I spent about just two summers in Kuchikoy, but I've been involved with Chitilhuk since about 2009. And so we'd frequently go there. Um, we have a lot of, of people from Kuchikoy who work for us on site in a variety of ways. And so I, I've gotten to know many of them, which is how I had access to go do my ethnographic research. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of that, a lot of my ethnographic information is just from who I know and kind of going to people's houses while I'm there on the site. Right. When I'm at Chesilhuk, where you, I'm often there for uh, anywhere from two to six weeks for the summer. Um, that project is kind of because of the current geopolitical climate, kind of wrapping up mm -hmm. um, and and slow, it, it's kind of transitioning, but but yeah, there's been a lot of work involved. Yeah. With this. Yeah. Um, um, couple couple um, comments and questions from Aaron. Um, it yeah. says the Turkish tundra looks similar to the Armenian uh, to toner. Yeah. I don't know where the same type of bread is made. Also, I was wondering, if the roof exits protected against invaders, either human or animal. So the tonder, um, yeah, like that tonder style bread. And and now they're made, the tonder now is made with kind of a commercially manufactured red clay frame. And that frame is pretty ubiquitous about, hey, Scott, that frame <laughs> is pretty ubiquitous around um, a lot of the, a lot of kind of the, that, that tandoori style bread. So you can see it in India, you can see it in Armenia, and you can see it in Turkey. It's, it's kind of all over that region where they eat, mm. people who eat the tandoori bread. Um, and you were wondering if the roof exists. Yeah, I mean, the roof is probably, it would protect against invaders or, or human or animal, but it's more, it's, the roof is probably for uh, weather, to, pr to protect it from the weather now. Um, at least at Chetzelhuk, and I'm not sure, I think that at, at Chetzelhuk, uh, we have very little sign, actually no sign of people who died of violent death. Mm -hmm. However, it might be that people who die of violent death aren't buried on site. They might be buried somewhere else. Um, and so likely the roof 
it, and in Kuchikoi, the roofs are for the weather to pr provide both shade in the summer and to pr protect them from the rain and snow in the rainy season or the cold winter. All right. Um, does anybody have any other comments or questions for Sheena? Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, Sheena, you were going to make a, a an earth oven. I know it's still my plan. I'm going to do it. Plan. Okay. Yeah. When, as soon as we move, actually, that's like one of the first things on my agenda is to build one. Oh, cool. Are you doing it because you like the bread like that? Or are you going to fold that into your experimental sort of archaeology yeah. and um, comparative yes. studies? Yes, both. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's also really efficient. Like, I love bonfires, but I hate the smoky, just disgustingness of bonfires. Mm -hmm. And the tonder style bread oven, you don't get it. Like it's so clear and fuel efficient and it burns so cleanly, even for biomass fuel. And that'll work in this climate? It's a good question. I gotta find, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta go, I got, it'll probably. All right. I just I bury it in the winter. Mm. So I, I was kind of fascinated by those um, those figurines that you showed right at the yeah. beginning of how, and how you said that they contrasted with what what the people who lived there actually looked like. Are they, I mean, were they possibly like figurines of deities or something that they might have worshipped or? So there, there's all sorts of interpretations of what they might be. And I, mm -hmm. I kind of gloss over that a little bit intentionally because there's this sort of mother goddess idea that they're a fertility symbol or something like mm -hmm. this that becomes really common. Um, but honestly, we don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. They're a big contrast from what the people looked like. Um, there's a lot of ideas about it could be religious representation. It could be a fertility thing. It could be um, any number of other things, but also I, I always like to come back to, it could have been kids toys, like little mm. dolls and things, right? Uh, there's so many different ways and, and we don't, they're not, we don't find them in any primary in situ deposits. We find them kind of in middens usually. So when they've been mm. discarded or, or dumped behind. Mm -hmm. And so there's not, we don't have really a good answer for it, but the prevailing narrative through time has been that they're a fertility symbol or mother goddess. And okay. then they connect it to um, a lot of the, the Paleolithic through early Neolithic. That kind of figurine is really common um, throughout the Near East. Okay. And uh, I don't I don't really like that storyline. I, I think that it's a little overly simplistic. Um, yeah. It's kind of like when in doubt, oh, it's ritual or. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I was just struck when you when you were describing the people and those figurines and the contrast. Yeah. It's so it, it's really fascinating that they wouldn't have made figurines that looked more like themselves. So well, and, and it's interesting too. There's a ton of leopard representation. So there's mm -hmm. there's a bunch of wall paintings with leopard with people wearing leopard prints. There's a bunch of wall reliefs with leopards. One a couple of the figurines where there's. Um, sort of a female figurine on a throne with leopards on either side of her. Mm -hmm. um, and yet uh, we've, I think we found like two, two toe bones from a leopard on site. That's it. No mm -hmm. other leopard bones have been found. And yet we have, the site has all of these representation of leopards. Mm -hmm. And so again, that could be like a whole bunch of different things. It could be that the leopard is this symbolic representation of something, um, mm -hmm. or it could be that the leopards are being processed elsewhere, or maybe they're just being skinned. And because if you skin a leopard, there's a pretty good chance that you'll end up with little toe bones coming mm -hmm. back to the site with you, but not the rest of it. Yeah. Um, no. That wow. happens in, uh, with bears too. Yeah. There. Yeah. And there's some people who argue that they had a <clears throat> leopard taboo, taboo, and I'm like, or they're just processing them somewhere else <laughs> yeah yeah um, well, i know that sheena has another meeting that she needs to get to at eight so i think we have time for one more question or comment possibly if you have any no i'm just sorry i missed it because i 
uh, came in late, but I didn't know about it. And then I was checking Facebook and I saw Sheena, Sheena's post. Well, we, we just, uh, we just recorded it. So, um, okay. the, the video will be available on the Peter White website so you can see it. Okay. Yeah, great. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, Aaron says, thank you. And I, I really thank you for taking, uh, time, uh, time out of your schedule tonight, Sheena, to, to be with us and share this really fascinating, fascinating archeological dig and all the discoveries. Um, I, I, I hope that, you know, I want to, I want to taste your bread when you finally are able to do it, you know. Yeah, I can't and, wait to make Palmer bread. It's so good. I don't know if I'm going to be very good at it, though. I think it's just going to be a disaster. You know, pra practice makes perfect, yeah. I guess. So <laughs> it sounds right. like maybe future farmer's market kind of item. Yeah. 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 I, I'll be watching for you at the farmer's market. So. <laughs> It's a lot of work. There's no way I'm sharing much of it if I do it. It's, it's a tedious, long process. I'll be, I'll be a taste tester if you need one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, um, thank you again for coming tonight. Thank you, Sheena, for taking some time out of your schedule. You're welcome. Um, and, Thanks for having me, Marty. Um, yeah, thank you all. And thank you, Scott and, and yep. Sam and uh, for coming tonight. So we'll see you all again. Thank, thank you. you.